Hi guys, welcome to a new video of Bitcoin Edge. Today we'll have an interesting talk with Salsa Tequila. Uh, hi Salsa, how are you today? I'm doing great, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you guys don't know Salsa yet, um, he's, um, he's quite a, a CT personality. Um, he has a really good track record, track record in sculpting. Uh, he was second in um, a large Bybit competition as well. Um, how much return did you get that time, uh, Salsa? I think it was a one-month competition. Made about 5,000%, I recall correctly. So it was like 0 0.16 Bitcoin to 7 point something. Yeah, and um, I, I remember correctly, you know, my friends were started talking about you and I was already following you on, on Twitter. Um, and at first I was like, well, yeah, it must be luck. Um, because the numbers he was pushing were quite impressive. And I, I, I mean, I was like, it, it must be luck. And then you're trading yourself as well at the time. And you're like, well, it's not only going up or only going down. We had like, we were basically ranging a little bit. Um, I don't recall uh, like exactly anymore, but um, yeah, it was really impressive. Um, so that's um, why I chose today to interview Salsa. Um, how did you get into uh, crypto? You had a history of gambling uh, before that? or? Yeah, so basically since I was in high school, I'm not going to go exactly into detail what I was doing, but it mm -hmm. was gambling on video games, which had uh, currency, goods and services that, that were traded from, for real life money. Mm -hmm. So basically what I, what I was doing is uh, gambling on, on those video games. And that kind of taught me how to think in terms of, you know, maximizing expectancy, uh, calculating it, trying to keep the edge on my side, like kind of a quantitative mindset similar to poker players. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did that basically all my high school and even early college days before I discovered uh, before I, I discovered crypto trading. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and that's also coincidentally what uh, led me to using Bitcoin because I was, you know, I was um, 15 years old when PayPal locked my account, so I, I could not transact anymore. They didn't like my business model. They, you know, <laughs> 15, 15, 15 yeah, years like, old. <laughs> yeah, I was a 15 years old kid gambling on MMO games and trading on black markets. Those video <laughs> games. So, you know, it was pretty weird sending and receiving decent amount of monies at, at the time and. They just locked my account, so I had to go look for somewhere else and uh, discovered Bitcoin that way. So, yeah, Life. that's pretty. That's pretty much what led me to Bitcoin and crypto trading. And um, pre-crypto, aside from that, I went to university. I did like a, a year in software engineering. Didn't like it. I kind of wanted to get the CFA afterwards, and um, I dropped when I got hired at the prop shop for trading. Mm -hmm. How, how, how did you get, did, did you get a um, um, few steps back? Um, how, how did you find out about crypto? I mean, you were uh, um, very young still, I think. Um, like, was there, wh where did you um, read about it? Or how did you get in contact with crypto? Or was it already, like, did yeah, you so know quite a few things but, about it already? Yeah, so it, it's really like PayPal locked, locked me from transacting. And I basically in the black markets I was uh, using for MMO gambling, they, they were all accepting Bitcoin at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I basically <clears throat> discovered Bitcoin that way, started to yeah. uh, okay. use various wallets, processor, you know, e even learned about it a bit. But at the time it was not like a investment or anything. It was just useful to me because I could freely sell and buy goods uh, with Bitcoin. Yeah, 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 exactly. And um, th then you started trading it, of course. <clears throat> yeah, so that was really lucky timing. It was 2017 bubble. I think a friend of mine told me about Ethereum. I bought like a few. It was a really tiny stake at the time, but everything bubbled. Bitcoin, Ethereum, everything went uh, berserk. Then I started buying a few altcoins that went like 100x. I experienced the whole bubble 2017. And... Um, mm -hmm. I remember, man, at, at the time, like the more number went up, the more I thought fundamentals were great. I was a genius. That, that was my first real genius phase in crypto. Mm -hmm. um, at the top, it, it was like uh, the swings were pr 
pretty pretty wild uh, yeah I, I did not cash out anything i just held my altcoins at the top i thought it was the future and it was mm -hmm. a genius it was going to go at least 10x yeah. again again and yeah. um 2018 happened when it hit <laughs> I, I cashed out like 10 percent, which i said okay if it all goes to shit, like that was after the first crash right i think from 20k to like 14k or something like that i, I sold 10 percent of my holdings around 14k and i held the rest mm -hmm. and that 90 percent, i just lost it all through the bear market um oh. all points that i held to zero and margin trading so compounded my losses like that but i i never stopped margin trading and um that's what led me to today so yeah and and, and the process from losing it all basically and to start trading at a prop firm how how, how did that go or how did that turn transition go yeah, so for margin trading, I, I started like in 2017, but that was really just 100x leverage longing and getting liquidated most of the time. Mm -hmm. But altcoins were making me so much money that it didn't really matter. Like I was still making money. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, like I, I, I was a stupid guy basically getting liquidated. Mm -hmm. 2018 is really what taught me how to trade because like the market was going down and a lot of sideways as well in some part of the year sometimes there were big bounces so i tried to time the moves i got i got um basically i was trading every single day even nights at times um i kind of i kind of i kind of had decent ideas like i was profitable in the sense that i think you know let's say for the first six months the last um i lost most of my network let's say there was a uh, Whatever I had left in crypto from the top, I had maybe 15% left. But I was mm -hmm. trading that profitably ideas wise, but I, I had terrible risk management. So I was like betting the house too often, taking huge risk on like tiny edge, trying, trying to make it all back in one trade. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I really stacked experience through 2018 and around mid year, I'd say, was profitable in terms of like, my idea is if I bet a constant amount, mm -hmm. it would generate the profit. But I was betting the house. Sometimes I would 20x accounts multiple times, actually. And uh, eventually they, they just go bust. So it's like two months. I grind, uh, grind an account up and eventually the, the streak hits and the, the dice rolls uh, tail, get liquidated. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time I, I longed XRP. Like I was not even an XRP trader. I just went all in long XRP because I've, I've seen something on Twitter interesting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it went south. It went south. I lost everything that day. That, that was brutal stuff, but stupid, very stupid like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I just kept margin trading through the entirety of 2018. I think I, at rock bottom, I had almost nothing left, um, like maybe two or three Bitcoin maximum. Mm -hmm. um, I did like a crypto cardinal competition. I think it was late 2018 that I won. I turned one Bitcoin into 3.15. Okay. Some, something of the sort. Yeah, I, I could find it real quick for you to. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. Yes, basically. Um, basically, I was just uh, trading and trying to survive and eventually late year i stopped losing money um around late 2018 mm -hmm. but i was um i was not profitable right off the bat but Kinda late but late late 20, 2018 for example we had um, we had like the 6k area you know and bounces off that 6k area were uh getting yeah lesser and lesser like least high you know um um <clears throat> And then we had a big drop basically from 6k to um, three and a half K or uh, low three, no three K basically. Um, did you like, did you catch that big move and did you catch it on the right side or? The eternal, the eternal range. Now I was mostly a range trader. Like I had a tendency to fade moves, be contrarian in a way. Uh, when it broke down, I kind of, you know, I, I believed at first and then I, I disbelieved. I thought it was possibly spring back up and it went deeper than everyone thought. And obviously, uh, a lot of people got caught on that because like the narrative at the time was basically that uh, there was a minor floor and, you know, it would take a black swan or something to, to send it below 5K. So 
and I truly believe that that was stupid. Like I didn't understand the market, but that was just a huge misconception. Um, and you know, there was no black swan. It just dropped, kept mm -hmm. dropping. There was no black swan at all. It's just fair market. People sell, and uh, went all the way to three k and stayed there for a while, three to five k. Mm -hmm. right? So you know, it went deeper than I really thought. And obviously, I got burnt, but I was kind of already poor. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't. I did. Luckily, I didn't like. I didn't get hurt because I I was already like almost lost everything since the twenty seventeen time. You know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but when I say I stopped being unprofitable late late 2018, that's mostly because I lacked risk management, was betting the house all the time. Mm -hmm. I just sent you um, like the, the basically the screenshot of like that crypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I opened the tweet. Uh, the, the tweet is in the in the. In, uh, yeah, so in that was September 2018, and that's around where things started flipping well for me. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you did you did you did very well. Yeah. Uh, so from. So that was kind of my Kickstarter to stop being unprofitable. After that, I kept live streaming and like it was kind of my way to keep myself in check because I had a very tiny audience. But it's like when people are watching you, you know, I, I'm not going to bet all in when I keep talking about that risk management being so important because like it kind of gives me that uh, ego that I, I attach to the proper risk management and trying to not all in every time like i used to because i i would always end up liquidating my accounts right so that's kind of from where i stopped being a complete degenerate mm -hmm. and losing money mm -hmm. and um i was still betting too big i was yeah. betting like a 20 20 percent of my accounts in single trades oftentimes maybe sometimes a bit more when i cheated mm -hmm. so it, like when I say my account, like my, my total crypto stash, that's way too much. But like before that, I, I would do 50% It'd be like YOLO. Mm -hmm. So um, that, I, I was still over, over betting, but I managed to survive uh, until like eventually I found a bit of a consistency. I, I risk a lot less. Uh, I learned that there are opportunities that are worth betting big. There are opportunities that are worth, um, you know, let's say marginal times. Like uh, it just ranges and there's not much edge in taking a position. You don't want to take a big risk like you want mm -hmm. to go super tiny and just get a vibe for it but sometimes you're going to see a huge opportunity and then you want to you know you want to bet the house yeah you know, or a lot more <clears throat> mm -hmm. so i kind of learned the what not to do um the i hard, got my risk way. management yeah 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 got my risk management in check and you know I, I, there's not a single day aside like two weeks when i went with the with a friend in a trip that i like I trade Bitcoin every single day since like 2018, basically. So, mm -hmm. um, 2019 I was pretty solid and uh, started making great profit, especially when I started going full time in prop shop. So your initial question was when did I start in prop shop? How how did that go? So yeah, I went yeah. So that was basically the summer of 2019. I seen um I seen uh basically I I seen some advertisement. On Twitter from Bitbit Crypto saying his prop shop was hiring, um, and to DM him, and he he lived close to me at the time, so I, I DM'd him and went visit him, mm -hmm. and they gave me an interview and was was taken in basically. So I started around I think it was September 2019. Uh, I started trading really full time with with a prop firm, you know, um, professional environment, and. Um, that was the best decision of my life because up to that point I was still a university student and that really distracted me from um, from doing the right thing at many times. Mm -hmm. What I had the habit of doing when I was in university was I was really good at fishing for the entrance, mm -hmm. right? I, like I knew I knew I knew from watching the market where is a good entry. And, and, and can can you can you tell me like you're fishing for entries or, or bottoms and then looking for a long position basically right yeah so or... I, I basically i look like i look at the, a bunch of stuff or metrics or twitter news feed uh order books uh founding data price action whatever you name it and you know when you get a lot of screen time you kind of get a vibe of how things move yeah when something major happens when a pattern that repeated especially like if something tends to happen for like two weeks um or a correlation let's say 
what it, like let's say uh, it, it's correlated with the stock market like after the march 2020 crash or through the march 2020 crash that was a very cunning example and not everybody caught up to that um especially the days after the crash yeah so, how, how, how did how did how did that event go for you super well uh super that, well. Was, that was yeah I, I, i'll get to that after i'm done with sure that question. sure that was like the that was like my biggest uh bitcoin profit ever on the bounce not the crash the crash okay. i got not like everyone else but okay. you know i made bitcoin lost a lot of money mm -hmm. um and yeah so where was i 20 yeah so so basically i was saying how i got into uh prop shop so yeah that, that's basically through twitter uh we got an interview got hired and what i was saying is that when i was in university what i would do is um, observe the market in the morning. Sometimes I would get the great entry because oftentimes like I look at the market live and I react. Let's say there's a big move down and I think it's a buy. I, I, I tend to have like that um, like that, that sweet opportunity window where I can trigger a trade and know very fast if I'm wrong because I know I know what to expect of the market behavior after I get in, whether I'm right or wrong. What, if I'm what, right, what, I know. What, what time frame do you look at uh, if you're looking um, for? Um, the, it doesn't really matter the time frame. I'd say one minute if I look at impulsive moves. Like basically, it's like it's the same as, as one hour. It's just one hour is sixty yeah. one minute candle. So it, it's yeah. like it's all the same. Um, the time frame is not really the relevant part itself. Okay. Except like, of course, like if I'm if I'm gonna let the trade run, like I, I enter on, on a one minute candle and I let it run well in university, then. Of course, that's not really a good move, but most of the time I just know kind of what price I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I did a lot of PA back then. I was a big price action guy before I come in prop shop. Mm -hmm. So I'd say my favorite time frame was probably like one hour and I would use like five minutes to get in something, something of the sort. Mm -hmm. um, now I use a bit less charts than I used to. But um, yeah, so what I what I did was I entered trades and if I got a good lucky entry, I just let it ride while, while I'm in classes. And, you know, since my edge was basically getting the lucky entry, mm -hmm. I need to be there to get the to, to do the exit the same way that I entered. Right. So mm -hmm. I was not exiting my trade. I was just entering, mm -hmm. never exiting. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'd go to class close my cell phone because I try to be a decent student. Well, you do it I on your cell phone, not even a laptop. No, no, but I would look at the quotes. Oh, okay. That's what I mean. Like yeah. I never, I never phone traded, but I would look at the quotes if I didn't close my cell phone. Oh, yeah. So yeah. If I'm not going to phone trade, might as well close it, right? Yeah. Pay attention in class. So, um, yeah, oftentimes my, the trade would go my way, maybe three times my risk. Um, and then I come back home stuffed out for one th for, for my risk. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not just like you lost your risk. It's like you lost all your unrealized PL as well. Mm -hmm. maybe i would have gotten a decent exit not necessarily sold or bought the top or the bottom but at least i would have exited in profit perhaps mm -hmm. instead no it's a full loss so it's like a three to four hour loss um in, instead of plus two two risk multipliers or whatever it is mm -hmm. so so yeah when i went into prop shop basically my job was trading so i stopped doing that uh, I stopped letting trades, you know, go my way and popcorn on me back into a loss because mm -hmm. I was paying attention. So let's say I enter a trade because I think it's a lucky spot and I say, OK, I think it can go because whenever I enter, what I do is I have like a maximum target. So let's say I enter now at uh, let's say I enter along at 31K and I think, OK, I'm going to let it run. I, I think 33K is a big resistance. So I'm going to set my offers at 33K to close. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, it won't even like I, I should probably close it way before that mm -hmm. um, because my entry reasons are not necessarily price based. It's mostly price action and um, order books, data, and sometimes a few statistics that I use or, you know, it, it's, it's a slim edge. And um, 33K is very ar arbitrary. It's just like a general zone that I think should provide resistance on, on that specific hypothetical example. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so that's what I was doing. I had super wide targets and I just let the trade run. And I stopped doing that when I went to prop. I was watching all the time. So most of my exits were became the same way as my entries, manual. And to this day, it's still true. So 
instead of trying to get super lucky on a on the wide target, mm -hmm. um, I exited. I started exiting the same way uh, as I entered, and mm -hmm. uh, that was a game changer for me. I remember my my equity curves were like going parabolic up. Um, I, I was really the first the first uh, the first year in prop, super a lot of progress. Okay. Mostly, but, well, that's that's one thing among others that changed them, a big one. So, mm -hmm. And and did they um, coach you? Did they train you in certain ways? Did you? They don't. Uh, they don't tell you where to click. That's a big misconception, and mm -hmm. there's no magic trick as well. Mm -hmm. But it's in a professional environment. Your people are watching you for your risks. Um, basically, basically, I am the one who trades, and I did not. You know, they did not teach me a way to trade. They just taught me, you know, how trading works. For example, like. Uh, we did we did reviews of, of uh, traders at the end of every week. So we present a few trades, why we enter, uh, what was the plan, you know. And it, it's very important to be diligent with those things, especially when you're learning. So we, we were kind of uh, getting co coached not for our trades specific, like not for our trade outcomes, but you know the reasons why why we take exactly. A trade. Um, you know, let's say you want to long. Well, okay, where do you long? What's the plan? What what would be your invalidation, your stop loss? And they were pretty adamant that we need um, to use stop losses, right? Yeah, it's, it's it's not something that everybody necessarily use, but I think, especially in crypto after the March uh, black swan, it's been proven that we need. In my opinion, if you don't use a stop loss, it's it's stupid. Yeah, you always have to do it. Like. Um... Do, do, you, yeah. do, you, do you place uh, stop losses on, on, on the index price or, or how, how do you look at that? Um, uh, well, it depends. Uh, you can, I, I do often mark price because okay. like, but I think what I don't like with uh, some exchange, you don't offer that option. Like for example, FTX, you cannot do mark index or mm -hmm. mask mm -hmm. Like it's just, a, it's just a mark price and the mark price is basically uh, FTX last traded. So yeah. But but most of the time, let's say I traded by it. I think it was mostly my stuff, just because personal preference. Um, if you use last traded, you're more prone to, you know, let's say there's a wick on that specific exchange you use and nowhere else, you're, you're at risk of getting stopped out. So yeah, I and, mean, and you know, it, it's double edged, but it's double edged sword. I mean, yeah, I mean, but, it, uh, yeah, yeah. I prefer mark price. Yeah, plus. I mean, it it was. Uh, um you know um arthur hayes exchange you know max uh, bitmax um yeah. i remember the ethereum wicks i think oh. it was uh, 2019 or 20 yeah yeah 2018 maybe two, 2019 i think um they did not have competition back then so they, yeah like, it was a huge wick i think most of the like everyone with a stop got absolutely fucked yeah but they did not compensate or really care because like they were alone at the top right no competition yeah. Why would they? I mean, he, he he was a businessman, not a priest, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the quote where he says, uh, "Liquidation is a privilege." Because, like, <laughs> no, but funny enough, I agree with him because if you could get a debt from crypto, so many lives would be fucked right now. Imagine, like, you go, you, you get a negative balance, and you get some fucking people coming up coming after you. Like, that's impossible. Like, the exchange couldn't pull that off anyway, but. If that was possible, people would get so fucked. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, interesting days. Um, yeah, the, the the March event that clicked for you. Um, oh, something else. What is your favorite exchange and why? Uh, I used to trade Bitmex before Bybit, and then Bybit through twenty nineteen and twenty twenty. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I trade a bit everywhere: uh, Binance futures, Deribit, FTX, Bybit, all together. Mm -hmm. I try not to get attached to a specific exchange. Uh, if I had to choose, I would say I really like—I I still really like Bybit, um, mm -hmm. just because it's kind of like um, my um, how do you say that in English? Coup de cœur in French. Like I—I I just like it. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's kind of degen land in a way, but you yeah. still got isolated and cross leverage uh, all together, and you, you got some. It's really reminiscent of Bitmex, and when dislocations happen, 
there's certain strategies that work only on those kind of systems. Yeah, and, um, and also, also what I think is, is sorry, go on, because now I'm interested in what you said, we were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. I, I won't talk a lot about this, but you remember, for example, the March crash, mm -hmm. there were dislocations on Bybit and BitMEX, and you know you couldn't do that on, on Deribit or something that, well, on Deribit there was something else. I think, it, I think on Deribit there was the fact that you can use um, unrealized PNL as collateral, you could you you could basically because the index was like five thousand mm -hmm. dollar, and the last traded there was like three thousand eight hundred, right? Mm -hmm. When everything got fucked, Bitmex shut down. Mm -hmm. So on Bybit, you could hundred x long, with like almost no liquidation risk. Like price needs to go twenty percent against you to liquidate, and you get the hundred x leverage long from below four k. Yeah, and that's basically what I did. I, I don't even. I remember I just fucking smash all in market buy. <laughs> Instantly, I'm I'm in profit like twenty five percent, and um, that's that's from where from where what gives gave me basically the the safety cushion to keep milking the market. I think on there a bit there was something else going on. The fact that you know you can use you can use your unrealized PNL as collateral to open more margin. You could basically use a giant risk risk-free similar position from the bottom let's say a giant long it was obviously a giant long only but you could just repeatedly add to your long position because um the unrealized pnl was on the on the on the mark price or index i'm not sure so they had problems and had to compensate using the insurance fund i think it got drained but they fixed it mm -hmm. and now it's now it's it's not possible anymore but uh, those kind of dislocations that happened in march 2020 man that was amazing that's kind of what gave me the head start and then i just kept clicking from that and it's like that safety cushion and that from that 100x yeah allows me to take big risks <clears throat> and um and uh still even if my big risks go to shit, it, it's not gonna like i'm still gonna be in huge profit because of that um, single trade from like 3.8k to 5.5k and I, I made a lot more profit afterwards so march crash was really a, hor a horror story for many Mm -hmm. um, me as well, I got hurt. On the crash, I made a few Bitcoin, like, made a little bit of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, but I was down a shitload in dollars because I was a, yeah. a inverse perp trader, right? So when the price collapsed for, from 12k to 4k, I lose, uh, you know, I lost like 60% of my value or something stupid. Like the, basically in one day, it dropped, it dropped from 10k to 4k, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember it myself very yeah. well as, as well. Like, I was. I was sculpting and yeah, travel was... restrictions. I think it was Trump announcing a, a ban from Europe to, I don't know if it was Europe or China, like uh, air flights, commercial flights ban. Mm -hmm. And the uh, SPX started crashing and crypto followed and went way worse because liquidation started cascading. And at the bottom, I was watching BitMEX books and there was like not even 10 million of liquidity down to zero. And way more than that in in liquid in long liquidations, then they get DDoSed, um, or yeah. so they claim. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. I remember when they got DDoSed, every spot exchange I had a lay I had a layout open with like Bitstamp, Coinbase, Binance Spot, mm -hmm. um, and and everything started lifting on spot exchanges whenever Bitmex went offline, and. Mm -hmm. um, I bit stalled behind, and that's what gave me the free long. Basically, I, I was seeing freaking Coinbase, Bitstamp, Binance at like 4.8k. Bybit was at 3.8k, so it was kind of like, what am I doing? All the market makers liquidated. I'll take all that piece of the pie. Yeah. I, I just, I just didn't think like buy. Right. <laughs> wow. Anyway, that was that was fun, crazy times. Yeah, yeah, and and um, yeah, wow. That that is that is kind of a, and and Bybit didn't have any trouble uh, keeping up with the market, didn't it lag? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, every exchange was kind of Bybit had like no liquidity. It was kind of I think the market maker got hurt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, everything cascaded. Bybit, Binance, you name it. Not a single exchange did not have problems. Um, Bybit was kind of freezing a little bit at times. If I recall correctly, like it was not system overloads, but sometimes it, it's just getting glitchy a bit, similar to Binance and volatility, I'd say. 
um, there, in my opinion, there's no perfect exchange to this date. Like they all kind of have issues. Mm -hmm. Try to keep it low. Mm -hmm. um, Bybit, Bybit did let me place orders, obviously, and especially after after the crash and bounce, then it normalized and um, there was there was a like everything was working properly. I think everywhere else as well. So yeah, but through the crash, there were definitely times where it, it got a bit glitchy and problematic. And yeah, I think, I think every exchange yeah. really suffered that. Um, overall, it was good. I'd mm -hmm. say like there, there was not a freaking one minute time window where you can't play. There were there were kind of um, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, if I recall, like at, at like uh, in the five k to four k last drop. Like if you tried to click, it was kind of like, it's like you, you don't really exactly see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it was decent, but uh, definitely not perfect. Yeah. And um, of, of this year, what was your biggest, did, was, there, was there an event this year where you said, oh man, I, I killed this event or this, this week or. Um... That was the, that was, actually there were two. And one of them was super stupid. So let me just go check on the charts. So that was the first one was April 18 on the 50 watt on the 60k to 50k crunch. I was I was short through futures because futures were trading at like at like 20 to 30 percent premiums, and. Um, when the crash happened, that premium went into backwardation. Mm -hmm. I, it's like, not only I'm short from 60K, well, at, I mean, it was not 60K, it was above 70K, and suddenly it's, it's trading at 48K. But I was short on Deribit futures December 31st and whatnot. So I, I was looking at this going in backwardation, and I was seeing so thin liquidity like if you zoom out the books oh de Decem de de december um that yeah, was yeah, basically december was... contracts on, on there a bit they went they went oh, in backwardation sorry. oh yeah, yeah yeah sorry so so um when the crash happened i tried to i tried to cover it at one dollar um because i was seeing the liquidity was so thin i'd say if there's one big seller like 500k that's it i get still at one dollar you know what and the... um <laughs> So all night I was I was putting bids on every single future, trying to catch like that stinky wick to like one dollar because I know yeah. if one big near pukes is gonna happen. Whoa. And um, it turns out it, it turns out it was impossible because Deribit has a protection against it. <laughs> basically if you if you smash a market sell or market buy and it goes wider than a certain spread, like it, it won't let you. They're a bit as protection against it. Oh. So I wasted my freaking night. I did not cover my short. And instead of covering at like 48K, like I could have covered even way, way below 48K. Like it went really backwards, if I recall. Or like below 50K, at least I could have from 70K plus. So that, that would wow. have been a huge PL. Instead yeah. of that, I covered when it, when it went back to like, I don't know, 55K. And oh, okay. um, it was at like slight, slight premium again. So. I wasted my like that was a huge opportunity cost mm -hmm. and the um, fuck up that I I realized afterwards because I was okay with that like the fact that I missed out mm -hmm. before I realized that there was not not even a slim chance that I get a hit at one dollar like my plan was super good I think um, you know if I get one one hit at one dollar bank bank is made but yeah the fact that it was impossible that's what that's what stings. Uh, so, after the fact yeah so so you're kind of let's say a high IQ trader um and you're looking for uh, opportunities with premiums and discounts in futures yeah, and think, stuff like I that very like uh, I'll, I'll speak about the second opportunity like that in 2021 which i did not miss this time. um yeah but w when was that these opportunities oh. they they are the best in crypto when there's huge cascading liquidations mm -hmm. and uh, basically the, sp the space is fucked into huge dislocations. That's where you get the biggest edge in crypto. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are my biggest paydays typically. Really? Um, so the second time was May 19, 2021. So that was the 42 K to 
to 29k crash that oh, crash yeah. I, I nailed it like um i, I remember I, I was kind of getting fucked um you know i i I had shorts at like 57k and I, I closed my short at the absolute top and on futures again. I think it was uh, basically I was I was short 57k or 55k or whatever. I covered my shorts at 59k because I thought it would, it would keep going up and then we kind of just jibbated down and mm-hmm. kept going down and I was I was just surviving at this point like mm-hmm. trying to like since uh, since maybe 50k I was down a little bit but when that crash happened like i remember we we crawled down and i was i was short before like the um, before we break down 42k but i covered in like high 39 or something like that like i did not think it would go that deep Mm -hmm. and then i after i covered i just went to sleep because i i thought i thought something was off people were like marging longing very aggressively and i did not see um any any big buybacks or any sign that would stop like it was just driving down a little spike back up and driving mm-hmm. down slowly again and all the while people were margin longing so it was didn't like see a bounce of, yeah yeah exactly and it was kind of just setting up for for a big squeeze maybe i didn't i didn't know that but mm-hmm. i thought if it squeezed downwards i want to be a buyer yeah uh, i want to i want to take advantage of like the the huge dislocations that tend to happen so i was kind of just setting alerts went to bed and uh, luckily, I did not get the alert overnight. I actually woke up, and it happened like two hours after I wake up. And um, or I woke up very early, if I recall. I'm not sure, but basically, I woke up, and it was grinding down. It started really collapsing. Mm-hmm. And um, I was I was mostly in tether. Okay. Uh, like 50-50 tether spot long, because I didn't, I didn't know what would happen, and thought it would be a wise move. Mm-hmm. And when that big spike happened to 29k, every like derivatives were super low in comparison to spot. And I think Bitcoin had a spread of like 3% or something stupid. But the most important, the, the most uh, the most important opportunity, I think, was Ethereum because it traded at like 1.9k on Bybit on Bybit while the index was above 2k. So it was something like 7% uh, spread or dislocation, if I recall correctly. Do, so do, I, do, I bought... do, you ha- do you have alarms for that or do you check it all manually? Yeah, I had Bybit open. Like I had BTC and ETH pairs on Bybit open. Like you can see the mark price a lot above like the last. Uh, yeah, 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 so yeah, 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 yeah. So someone got fucked on Bybit on that down move on Ethereum. And um, that was that was that was my money maker. That's it. I, bought a bunch of ETH and I longed as much ETH at 1.9k as possible mm-hmm. and I was I was on fixed leverage 100x because basically I had had market had to go like over 7% against me to liquidate so I took advantage of that pretty pretty big then on the bounce I managed to so, to sell like near the top like 2.4k or something so basically I bought I bought when somebody got fucked on ETH Mm-hmm. And there was huge dislocations at the bottom, seven percent spread, uh, Bybit derivatives super low in comparison to everything else. And um, when the when the when the up move happened, I, I just dump on like when the price is regulated everywhere. That was that was it. My trade's done. You know, I don't care if it keep go, keeps going up. Uh, there, there's no edge for me holding that. But my entry edge is neutralized. Right? So that was really a free money trade for me. Whether it goes like even if I got liquidated on that, good risk. So I'm, Ethereum really made me a lot of money. I'm kind of impressed, man. It's it's really high IQ stuff, but also um, it takes a lot of balls. Um, like, yeah, I mean, it could are, have are, kept crashing. I mean, a lot of people get spooked by it, you know, like they get scared, like oh shit, that's that's a big dump, you know, um, and yeah, you take you advantage of it. And, and you gotta go- think in terms of like. Um, EV, like it would be stupid not to bet as much as you can when you see something like that. In my perspective, mm-hmm. if you're if you're able to, but the thing is, most people are not able to because they don't survive. So when that crash happens, people are fucked. They get liquidated or whatnot, and they don't think about taking advantage of it. They, they think about like 
I don't know, they they they, they get liquidated. They they mm -hmm. they're not in the they're not in the position of strength, right? So surviving is very important, and that's two key elements of taking advantage of that uh, crash from 42k to 30k, and that the March 2020 crash as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh man, so interesting. And and how did you pick up on this type of trading? Did you um, did it get who who teached you? Who had this biggest influence on trading when it when it comes to this stuff? Um, that kind of stuff, I kind of picked it up myself from trading like tens of thousands of hours. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's been my life like 2018, early maybe late 2017. So it's literally all I do trading freaking Bitcoin. Okay. So I learned a lot. <clears throat> from just clicking a lot and experiencing the market. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's no other better teacher than having skin in the, in the game and trading. Um, you learn you learn a lot of what not to do, what to survive, and then then making money becomes like uh, second nature, nature. Like you survive long enough, you live through great opportunities like those. Um, yeah. And you, you learn to find edge uh, for for day to day, you know, it's not always as, as crazy as what I just said. There's day to days. Um, I trade a lot from news feed, uh, order books, market data. Like let's let's say founding is crazy. I'm not I'm not gonna be keen of like, for example, if if it's like a maximum founding and open interest is sky high, I'm not too keen of like holding long position and going on vacation for a week. You know? Yeah, like, and, and do do you use, for example, uh, a funding and premium indicator? Uh, I always use the New Butane funding and premium indicator. Uh, do you use anything I like that, or I don't, use, I don't use indicators that much? I like using price action to get mm -hmm. a very key confluence with other things. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say the market goes very vertical into a demand zone or supply zone. It's typically better entries than when it just grinds towards it, reject grinds again, rejects, and then grinds into it. Like typically impulse moves, like price action wise, I, I, I use, I still use that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really use indicators as, something, you know, just looking at the charts and seeing, um, seeing price move towards uh, certain areas that I may be interested in. And how price moves towards them is very important to me. So that's that's the basic of it for me. Um, yeah, I see that. So you, you have like the VPVR funding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm no, just I'm just showing the the, the funding indicator basically. Well, I use I use a buy buy bit B I B T B Y B T. Oh, bits. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'll call just, it. Like, yeah. Like just mark that data basically. Yeah, I just, I just want to know what the funding looks like, what the uh, like on, on various pairs. Um, and, you know, I remember like to give you a grasp, basically after the coin IPO or the coin launch, mm -hmm. coin based launch. Yeah. Um, market like there was super tick bids everywhere. Like market was stacked on the bid, uh, especially derivatives. And typically, like when that happens, market is so eager to buy that it ends up going up but after mm -hmm. the coin launch for like two straight days it just stayed above and kind of grinded into them and open interwest was sky high never seen you know never seen hate especially coin marginated open interest funding rates was super expensive futures at huge premium so mm -hmm. that kind of gave me a warning that something yeah. was off and i remember i was i actually shorted 62k that's oh. why I, that's why i was positioned short before the crash to 50k which, uh, as you now know, I, I fucked up my exit. Yeah. <laughs> because because of that stupid derivative mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. But yeah, like that's that's a good example of like me using price action as a context. Like mm -hmm. it just freaking grinded down into demand. While basically, if you look at news, it was all good news everywhere. You know, Coinbase IPO and feed in general. I follow a bunch of people. Like it was all bull posting on Twitter. Mm -hmm. which certainly give me a trade but like gives me a good idea of what the sentiment is like and mm -hmm. like why doesn't it move like it's been two days it's just still grinding down small spike up grinding down or whatever like a slow grind down towards the 60k um 
something's up. I'm not comfortable. So I, I kind of hedge through those futures because of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not like, uh, let's say, it, it, it dumps into 60K and gets bought up after tapping demand or whatever. Like, it, it's really just slow grind stays down, slow grinds more. Yeah. Um, so I, I use price action like that to give me a vibe a vibe of the market basically yeah and 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 um um man i'm, I'm pretty impressed of 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 uh how much you think things through and i mean okay mistake on, on their bit but um this is really the type of trading i like to do or do myself as well um because you do not want to buy something which is at a, at a high premium for example uh that's um do, do you have about my mentor a bit? Yeah, who influenced me. Um, so when I started in, in prop, that was this guy Bitbit Crypto on Twitter, who I learned a lot from because like he was basically the the one starting the the crypto department at the prop that I work with. Mm -hmm. Um, so I learned a lot from him and other guys there. As and you know, something that really shocked me is many people in prop they don't use you know charts indicators. Like some guys who were trading for longer than I knew markets, um, you know, decades, were, were barely using any technical analysis. Some of the guys, they just had a news feed, order books, um, not even crypto markets, like trading a bunch of stuff like oil or CME products, whatever, whatever it was. But they did not necessarily use technical analysis. And that's where I realized that that kind of fallacy we have on social media, especially like technical analysis being the holy grail, drawing tenants, mm -hmm. like it, it, it can work, it can provide edge, but it's going to be slim. It's not going to be the holy grail. Yeah. And uh, there's other ways to trade as well. So yeah. it kind of opened my eyes to stop being so biased about technical analysis specifically and incorp 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 incorporating various tools uh, statistics you know we we did have um like we did have help from quants to to like gather kind of market st statistics i think late 2019 it was and some projects but it was not all about ta anymore suddenly so that was a big eye opener for me a mm -hmm. uh, bit bit crypto as well like big influence because like he kind of taught me a lot about um you know taught well he got me in prop first of all Mm -hmm. And um, especially about like news interpretation of that uh, news feed, uh, they had they had something called uh, like basically a like a Bloomberg helmet terminal kind of things, and you know mm -hmm. all those FOMC events. I was not aware of that before I go in prop, and I just realized I need to pay attention to that because it brings volatility to crypto. Yeah. When I came in prop, and uh, still to this day, I'm still learning about those. Uh, legacy events that influence crypto markets in a in a pretty big manner and um bit, bit crypto has been a huge influence for me paying attention to that i was not even aware before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um uh, yeah, i showed bit, bit crypto in in screen by the way his twitter uh, handle um I mean, I was I was having a question as well, you know, do you have any PTSD from 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 crypto from trading? Um, but it seems like all the um, where everybody gets caught in the I don't know, like yeah, lost it all, make it all and lost it. All. Well, yeah. I already had experience with PTSD before crypto. So MMO gambling. Yeah. When I was around fifteen, sixteen, I made I made like sixty grand, mm -hmm. and I lost maybe fifty grand in two days, like thirty grand in a night. Oh. Then I went to school, and the next day I lost like. And then an additional 20 grand gambling on freaking candles to make it all back. And that was a big lesson for me because that was basically like all the money I had almost. Maybe maybe I lost 55k of 60k or something like that. How old were you back then? Like 15, late 15, I believe. 15 year old kid with 60k. Yeah, but, but you <laughs> know, easy, easy come, easy go, really. Yeah. Yeah, you, you learned that the hard yeah. way, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so um, I mean, that's, that's, ba that's basically everybody in crypto in 2017, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's kind of weird because to me it was all numbers because like I was just gambling on the internet. I was in my parents' uh, high school, 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I did, my friends didn't know about all this because like I thought it would be weird to like flex money on mm -hmm. or gambling such amounts. Like <laughs> you work a day job when you're in high school and all summer you, you make like, I don't know, six grand or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was it was kind of big amounts and not even my parents knew about it. <laughs> so so like when I lost that, it's like it never existed in the first place. Yeah. And now it really doesn't exist, you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I, I still went to school, kind of just sucked it inside and it, it just happened, right? So that was my first experience with those kind of PTSD things. And I think I handled it pretty well. Like I was not destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was a bit sad and like down, but not not like uh, I was functioning. I went to school, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. um, and then 2017 in crypto, uh, obviously the bubble made a shitload of money, and uh, lost ninety lost it all basically, ex except what I had cashed out to keep myself uh, safe and like to keep myself with something in case crypto collapses to zero. Mm -hmm yeah man what what a story and and um do, do you run any arbitrage bots or do you do everything manual or mm, i can't get in detail on that sure we had one project with prop shop that it was an idea i had and we kind of got with the quant department to like uh, make it happen but we were too late um because it was a strategy we wanted to run on bitmex then it was kind of too slow on the process and eventually mm -hmm. bitmex lost the market leader mm -hmm. um you know that was like 2020 so yeah bitmex stopped being market leader it's not the same with like other exchanges it's complicated like it's, it's yeah. not it was um quants that were trading that were working with legacy traders or legacy markets it's not the same okay. as crypto mostly. and you know let's say you want to migrate it to okx it's a whole different uh system i believe or whatever we, we kind of just dropped it the bull market happened just focus on clicking and making money you know mm -hmm. so we had one project and uh, aside from and it failed to to like uh reap fruits from it mm -hmm. and then and then i did not have i, I do not do robotic arbitrage uh, myself i mm -hmm. so personally no i don't do that okay okay um what would you say is the upside and downside of, of working at a prop uh, trading firm? You're in a professional environment for once. You get better trading fees. Well, you get capitalization as well, obviously, if you're starting. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you get mentorship uh, from experienced traders and access to you know information, an information network like you share information with the people you're with so, and most of all like trading is a very lonely job mm -hmm. uh, you know not not a lot of people outside of like crypto twitter understand what we do right mm -hmm. yeah so let's say i'm living in my freaking parents basement and just trade and nobody understands it and i can't really talk about it to other people because the amounts are quite large mm -hmm. like you you just can't talk about that to your friends to your friends uh, mm -hmm. outside of, in my opinion it's kind of weird so you, you kind of have a social aspect to it mm -hmm. um, um, you also have access to um, exchanges a desk like a, an office you know mm -hmm. as well if you have i don't have kids in an office at home so it's not, it's not necessarily a big perk for me personally mm -hmm. um, but you know just being with the guys professional environment you know, you, you share, you can share your losses and stories and people actually understand you. It's not like trader jargon that people yeah. think it's a flex, you know, it's like they understand the, the pains and joys, get kind of uh, um, people to like people to be with and, and trade with. And uh, it, it's, I think it's overall just upside in my mm -hmm. perspective as well. Like, let's say crypto goes to zero and I'm with up, I, I can get access to other markets a lot mm -hmm. easier but obviously i don't think crypto is going to zero and that's why i'm here but you can never discard the possibility albeit small mm -hmm. so yeah I, I think prop trading is great um, 
I don't see really downside as long as they let like they let me trade my personal account as well. So oh. like I don't have like I trade my personal account. Whatever I post on Twitter, it's never proption. <laughs> I would yeah. never post. I would never post something that's not mine. Yeah, you know, I not allowed for one and two. It's it's, it's their business. Like, um, but yeah, and I think it's upside only, and I, I love it. Uh, I love it. So that's why I trade with Propshop. And and um, do you have like personal? I mean, um, crypto is twenty four seven. Is is that a bad thing for you, or can you live with that, or does it ever? Like, I've kind of always been degenerate in lifestyle, <laughs> in the sense that, like, you know, even MMO gambling, it's like I would stay awake at night because there were opportunities sometimes. So it's nothing new for me. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, for health, it's very bad, but as well, like, things move so fast in crypto that um, I think financially it allows us to, you know, yes, it takes extra effort, sacrifices, but overall like you can make it a lot faster than in other markets it's a huge volatile market mm -hmm. if there's big opportunities at night um, you know for me I'm, I'm i'm eastern time zone so you know asia asia is awake while i'm supposed to sleep mm -hmm. <laughs> supposed to but yeah like, <laughs> i try i try not to fuck up my health mm -hmm. if it's not worth it but you know let's say i think i think something really big is likely to happen then I'll, I'll go the extra mile um generally speaking i like to get my sleep so what i do is i just set alarms for for if something very very big happen mm -hmm. big price, wide price alerts um and if i got a position i make sure that i you know, obviously i always have my stop stop loss and if you know i, I may have a little tighter alerts if it requires management but i survive it it's no problem for me i'm just used to it at this point Okay. Okay. Um, what 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 uh, kind of book would you recommend for uh, a trader? Did you read any books about trading, or was it all self-taught? Or uh, it's really self-taught. I got I made a Medium article because a lot of people ask me how to learn to trade. Mm -hmm. Kind of the Grail fallacy. They they think I got the magic secret, but it's really mostly about experience, learning what not to do, learning you know risk management as well. Because as I said in twenty eighteen. I, it took me at least a couple of months backwards. Like I would have been profitable way earlier if I learned to stop betting the house all the time. Just because if you bet too big, I think the I think it's called geometrical expectancy. I'm not like basically if you bet the house all the time, like you're gonna go bankrupt. It's just a matter of like a, a bad flip. Even if you're you you have a profitable trading idea, um, one hit and that's it. You're gone. You're, K zero, so you, I would always twenty x accounts and then go bust, or like at least at least ten times I did like ten to twenty x and then go bust mm -hmm. through twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. So I have a medium article about it. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm opening it right now. It was in your uh, Twitter bio. That's right. I, think uh, I wrote this like an evening because a lot of people ask me in DMs, and I was kind of getting tired of answering. Yeah, but that. Kind that, that sums it up really well. I think it's a good guide. Yeah, uh, that's what I would recommend to go read and go through. And if you if you want extra resources, the thing is, let's say you read the trading book. And I did that when I first started. I think Cryptorca recommended me a book that was, uh, I don't remember the name. Um, but I, I read, I basically listened to that audio book a couple times and I did not get everything. It's like, books about trading i feel once you have a certain amount of experience you're way more valuable because you understand the content mm -hmm. if you're new to trading and you get like, you're gonna read and you're gonna miss like 75 percent of the essence even if you read it twice because you're not you're not like um, you don't understand already how market works a bit so i think you've got to get your hands dirty and just trade and uh, at least, you know, most people lose. I, I heard your interview with Lowstrom. So obviously, <laughs> not everybody lose. First, yeah. But I was one of those, like, 18, 18 months straight. I just lost from 2017 to late 2018, right? So obviously, I was the other extreme case that was super stubborn and not learning fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I think most people will lose at first at least a couple months. And yeah. uh, you know, I'd recommend still having skin in the game. I think it's not the same. Like not having skin in the game is not the same. You're not going to experience it yeah. properly. And also, it's it's like kind of cheating because you don't get a, a feeling for the order book. Like I think if you're paper trading, you get like one contract fill and fills it all, or like you're always first in the queue. But in reality, if, if there's one million of orders before you, that one million needs to fill before filling you. So it's a lot trickier than mm -hmm. um, paper. But yeah. generally speaking, I'd say trade a lot, and that's how you're gonna you're gonna get to learn. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that guide that guide is uh, that guide I, I wrote on Medium I think is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm opening it. I will put it in the video description as well, guys, um, so you can read uh, how to get uh, started with trading from Salsa Taguya. Um, is there something else you want to talk about? Because I think. I showed you the list and uh, like I got more than I asked for and I'm already really happy. Um, um, let me read. Can you tell me more about Bybit competition? Yeah, I, I could add that competitions. Yeah. It's not the same as regular trading. You know, you see those crazy returns. Like I got lucky. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it was not all luck, but people people seem to like be impressed by crazy wins. Mm -hmm. um, like I could have never done that with a big account. Um, no, I basically like went full degen at the start, got a got a lucky head start, and then after you get the lucky head start, let's say you start with zero point one coin, you go all in, and suddenly you have zero point five. Every zero point one coin you make from that zero point five is a hundred percent ROI. Yeah. So you know those bybit competitions are made in a way that advantage just um, small starts and going full degen from the start. So like competitions it's not it's not like uh trading a, a big account yeah and, uh, i think yeah i think people are generally like super impressed about those kind of things but it, it's not representative of what trading should look like yeah 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 i totally i totally agree and um um it makes a little bit of a casino out of it um, yeah <laughs> and, i kind of feel is it, it in in the way that those kind of moves like promotes the wrong things in some ways if people don't understand you know, uh, nuance, mm -hmm. nuance i don't know if i pronounce it right but yeah like it, it's dangerous to think it's normal returns yeah um i'm reading the list to see if there's something missed um, oh the minimum am amount of money i think um someone needs to to uh, live off of trading or to go go full time or something something like that um yeah so you know that question about like how much money i think someone should need to live off of trading um i think trading is like basically the business of risk so you need to be set financially for like a good amount of time at least because if you depend on trading consistent trading returns to live your everyday life then you're going to be very tempted to take shitty bets because you need to make money to survive right so i think that at least like one year of living covered to live off, off of trading is a bare like minimum requirement mm -hmm. like per opinion and side note when i started in prop sh in prop trading um I, I would have like I had enough money to live like two years um, on my own outside of like a trading caution that I had on, on top. So like mm -hmm. I would have never went, I, I would have never dropped university to go trade from with a prop shop if I did not have that huge financial caution to to back me up. Like if shit happens, if it just doesn't work, I can do something else, right? I got like at least two years of expenses covered. So I think it's important to have a solid caution uh, because if you don't, you're you're at a disadvantage from the start. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that, but I think it's the reality. Mm -hmm. and, um, so yeah, that's my take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that that is that's basically how it worked with me as well. Uh, I got I, I was I was a bit lucky, I would say, with getting in lazy, uh, sorry, early. Um, so you have that caution to get into it and. Um, 
because that's how I started, you know, I started quite um, in 2017, 16, 18, yes. you know, that's where I really started trading. Um, but before that, I was already in crypto from 2013. Um, so you have, I don't know, money to chill with and then to trade with, uh, kind of. Um, what do you do after you've um, uh, got hit with a loss? Um, I, I think that the biggest losses I've ever had in trading were following two things. I either make a shitload of money mm -hmm. and get comp uh, feel like I'm a god mm -hmm. and um, you know start taking huge risks and you know if it goes to shit I just lost the profit but the profit is already fucking like freaking massive mm -hmm. and, uh, relative to my net worth so then I take a huge loss or after losses um, and that one is a lot trickier because sometimes it just it's, it just doesn't go your way you know market has those phases and chop sideways, uh, bullish, bearish, whatever it is, you're not always going to be in sync, but losses will happen hundred percent of like every every trader goes through losing period. Mm -hmm. And how you deal with those is very important because if you get complacent after a loss, um, you can really dig a grave and and um, you know, go go and do stupid mistakes. And oftentimes, and I stopped doing that. I think when I started in prop, uh, after 2019, never done it again. But before that, that was a, a very frequent occurrence. Like I would start, I would lose money, have a bad month. And then I would just try to like, it's like you get that feeling of entitlement, you put the time, you put the effort. Uh, you kind of sacrifice health for the market and then it takes money from you so you feel like the market owes you and then you cascade those bad decisions after bad decision and sometimes you know you're not in the right winner winning mindset and to focus on profit like on, on the you got to focus on getting extracting value from the market right mm -hmm. but that you, you kind of focus on making your money back That's exactly extreme and that's extremely dangerous because market owes you nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's how you did trade. And I did that a couple of times. Uh, even before crypto trading, I did that in like MMO gambling. Mm -hmm. Like it gets dry. You don't necessarily have the opportunity to make your money back right away or to make some value back at least. Sometimes it's going to take days or to, to get like a solid opportunity to at least bet something decent that could make a difference. And you just go and berserk on the marginal opportunities and cascade those bad decisions over bad decisions. So after losses, got to be very careful. Um, I have that rule on my personal accounts that I like, you know, the use case for leverage, especially in crypto, it's, it's, it's very easy to access leverage in crypto, like mm -hmm. no other market in the world. You dip, you make an account, thirty seconds deposit Bitcoin. That's it. You have access to a hundred x. Stupid in a way, but the use case of that is not only that you can trade your whole stack with like a fraction of it, because if you use leverage properly, that's um, that like that's how I do it. But also, it diminishes the counterparty risk of an exchange, of course. And uh, I use that as a hard stop for myself. So let's say I lose money. Um, like right now, what I do is I don't deposit more than say 10% of my crypto on, on leverage platforms at a time because that keeps me from taking too big risk. Mm -hmm. And um, you know I'm gonna treat that 10% extremely seriously. I'm not here to lose what I'm, what I can afford to lose, but I'm here. But if it goes south, I'm not going to deposit again until like a night's sleep at the very least. Yeah. If I deposit after a loss and I know that, you know, there's not necessarily going to be, you know, after I slept and I wake up and I see that the market is kind of boring and there's not necessarily opportunity to make, um, to make my, like, to make no marginal bets, I'll deposit smaller. So leverage can serve me as a hard stop in a way. And I don't get the account liquidated. Don't get me wrong. I 
always use a stop loss, but let's say that 10% that I had on exchange becomes a 5% after a big hit. And um, then, you know, either I don't, I don't redeposit and start from very small or I deposit smaller. And then if, if, I, if, I, if it goes south again, I, I, I keep depositing very, very small in a way that will never bankrupt me. So that's kind of how I survive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I kind of said I lost for 18 months straight, 2017 to 2018. I already had that incorporated in me. Like, I would not deposit all of my... I always had more in cold storage than mm-hmm. exchanges. Mm-hmm. Simply because I know myself, I know I'm very like when I see a good opportunity, I'll, I'll risk the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, if it goes south and uh, I start being off sync, it's extremely dangerous because um, because I like if it goes south and I I start I keep betting that big and I'm off sync with the market, then it can go really south and cascade into a grave. Yeah. So I use leverage kind of that way as a hard stop. It's mm-hmm. not like uh, you know. With prop, you get some people watching you. You get like lim- risk limits. Uh, you lose a certain amount. You should probably stop for the day and come back the next day or something like that. Mm-hmm. When I trade my personal accounts, no, it's, it's I'm the I'm the trader. I'm the risk manager. Yeah. And uh, and uh, if I want to like, if I bet it all, I'm I, that's it. I, I cannot afford that risk, you know. So I keep myself in check like that. Um, and also leverage kind of. You know, let's say you, let's say I have like five percent of my st- leverage platform. Then, you know, I need I need to use twenty x to trade my full stack. Mm-hmm. Um, then, what happens is I that kind of that kind of reminds me to aim for luckier entries and to mm-hmm. be less impulsive on the entry and more picky. Yeah. Because because you don't have that much price margin, so you want to get in as close to your invalidation as possible. So that kind of keep the complacency away from me in the sense that I think in terms of downside first, like, okay, I think market goes up. Where do I enter as close to my invalidation as possible? I need to know where my invalidation is up front. So I don't make those stupid mistakes of just entering without predefined risk ever. So mm-hmm. that's another perk of it. Kind of that reminder, although it should be second nature. 